This morning we'll look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 1. The Bible says this, So I returned. That is a curious phrase. We'll deal with that at the end of the message this morning. <clears throat> so I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed. This life's a tough life, isn't it? Well, let's just be honest. This life is not an easy life to live. You can't hardly go a week without there being some sort of negative news that comes into you personally and affects you personally. It's a tough life. There's many tears been shed this week by people in this church, by people in this community. There's been tears shed this week because life's a tough life. And Solomon says, he says here, I considered all that. And boy, what a sad statement. He says there in the middle of verse 1, it says, and they had no comforter. And on the side of their oppressors, there was power. Well, you know, we, we get somebody mad at us, it seems like they've got the power, doesn't it? When things aren't going right, it seems like whatever the source is of those, of those problems, it seems like there's more power there than there is with us sometimes. Solomon said, I considered all that stuff, that they had no comforter, and on the side of their oppressors there was power, but here it is again, they had no comforter. Verse 2 says, Wherefore I praise the dead, which are already dead, more than the living, which are yet alive. Yea, better is he than both they which had not yet been, who hath not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. I think those last two verses are, are some pretty sad verses. That's a pretty pessimistic outlook. That's a pretty depressed outlook on life. Uh, and I think it was the man Job that said, I wish I hadn't even been born. Because the oppressor of Job was Satan himself. And you know what? Many times our oppressor is Satan himself, but many times our oppressor is our own selves. We're the ones that cause the problems. And we look at those problems in our life, and many times we look at those problems and we say, you know what? I, just, I don't know how I'm going to get over that. I read this to the Wednesday night uh, crowd that was here, but many of you weren't here Wednesday night, so I'll, I'll say it again. Uh, the, the student will remain anonymous, but I had a student at Lebanon High School hand me a note on Monday that said, I was, con I was uh, considering suicide, but then I thought about how you said you loved me. And that's what she told me. And the note said I was considering suicide, but I didn't because of you. That's what the note said. That student came to me and said, said you, you've told us in this class before that you love us. And that student said, do you mean that? Hey. I said, you better believe it. I said, you go to church anywhere? No, I've got to work on Sundays. I said, I'll tell you what. I gave, her, I gave her my card, and I said, the first Sunday that you're off work, you call me, my wife and I will personally pick you up and bring you to church. Folks, there's, there's thousands upon thousands upon millions of people in this world that think there's no hope. You know why they think there's no hope? Because they haven't considered the God in heaven. You know why they think there's no hope? Because they're looking at their life that's consuming them. They're looking at the oppression around them. They're looking at the negative situations around them. And they can't see past that. And they can't see up to see God is sitting there ready to try to help them if they would just call out to Him. And so they say, well, there's no comforter. There's no hope. What's the point? And then you have great tragedies when people take their own lives and destroy their own lives with drug abuse and substance abuse and alcohol. And they go right down that road, the road that the devil wants them to go down, because they don't for one second consider that Jesus cares and that Jesus loves them. He's the best friend you and I ever have. The best friend. He loved us enough that he died on the cross when we were his enemies. He died for my sins. How many of our enemies have we shown ourselves kind to? Ooh. <laughs> We're continuing the thought here in Ecclesiastes 4. The results of turning away from God. And we see in these verses the utter desolation, the depression, the despair of oppressing times. And a man that gets in that position and will not consider God will have no hope, will see no comfort. But this morning I want to tell you the comforter has come. He's here. You can have him if you want him. All you got to do is ask. Let's pray this morning and we'll get started. Father, we, we love you. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to, to come together again with, with your children and this, this great group of folks at Spring City. Lord, we thank you for the, another opportunity to meet. 
And Lord, the only thing would be better is if we could be in your presence this morning. And so we pray, even so come Lord Jesus. But Lord, we understand until then, there's, some, there's quite a bit of things that we need to focus on in this life in terms of how we live for you and how we please you and work for you. And I pray this morning, Lord, you'd help us to see that there is hope with you, that there is comfort with you. And Lord, that there's, there's not a hopeless situation in this world and there's not utter despair that can't be overcome. But Lord, I, I pray you'd help our hearts today as we look into your word. And Lord, if there's someone here this morning who's never been born again, Lord, may they understand that's the very first step to living a meaningful life. That's the very first step to getting out of the bondage of sin. And Lord, for those of us that are born again, may we not entangle ourselves therein willingly again. But may we stand fast in a liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. I pray you'd help our hearts this morning. Lord, help us to believe your word. Lord, I pray you'd put your power upon me and fill me with your spirit, that the words that go from my mouth will be pleasing in your sight would help the hearts of these your dear people today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now we, we've seen the despair here in, in Solomon's writing. We've seen the fact that, that he's, he's come, he's returned. And again, I'm going to deal with that phrase in a minute. He's returned. In other words, he's, he's come back to himself in, in a sense. And he's considering all the desolation, all the oppression, all the trouble of life. And he looks out at the sons of men. And can't you see, boy, if, you know, you remember those, those pictures of Jerusalem. Can't you see Solomon sitting out there on, on a rooftop or such, if you will, of the palace or the temple even, sitting out there and just watching people and saying, boy, you know, these people, their lives are full of trouble. And there's no comforter for them. And boy, that, that'd be a terrible state, wouldn't it? That'd be a terrible state to have problems on every side and nobody could help. That'd be a terrible state to be in. I'm telling you, the Lord is our present help in time of trouble. Uh, oh, Nahum 1 7. What, what is it, Miss Hillary? <laughs> Do you remember it? <laughs> I did put you on the spot. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that are his. Amen. Lord is good, isn't he? He is a stronghold in the day of trouble. Well, that's a blessing. And um, I like Brother Eggers had his sign over there at Greendale. I don't know if anybody's seen it. You know, we, we sing the song, Jesus loves me, this I know. Do you see his sign? It says, Jesus knows me, this I love. I, I like that. Hey, I'm glad, Father, I'm, I'm glad you know me. <laughs> I'm glad I've got a, a direct line to you whenever I need you. Well, that's a blessing, folks. We can enter boldly into the throne of grace to obtain mercy and help in time of need. Boy, that's a blessing. That's a great thing. The only way for you and I to truly deal with the troubling times in this life and gain victory is through Jesus Christ and through his comforter. And so we're going to look at the comfort of the Spirit, number one, this morning. But before we look at that, turn, if you will, to Psalm 69 and Job 16. Psalm 69 and Job 16. Psalm 69 and Job 16. Psalm chapter 69 and Job chapter 16. We'll look at Psalm first. The Bible said in Psalm 69 and verse 19 there, the Bible says this, Thou hast known my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. You know, that's a sobering statement this morning. Because the Lord knows our reproach and our shame and our dishonor. And it says, Mine adversaries are all before thee. Verse 20, Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. That's a tough spot to be in, isn't it? And I look for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. Now, that's a psalm of David. That's a man that God said, that's a guy after my own heart. That's a man, and David, King David is the man that even over there when you get to Solomon and Rehoboam and Jeroboam and all those other subsequent kings, that God looks at him and says, you're walking evil. You're not walking in the way of your father David who loved me and kept my commandments. God even reminded those guys three and four generations down the line. This is from David, the man after God's own heart. And David says... 
I can't find anybody to take pity on me when my adversaries are against me. He said, I can't find anybody to take comfort on me when I'm faced with my adversaries. Now, is that true? <laughs> that can't be true. Because David knew God was there for him. But listen, you and I can get in such deep despair and such dark places that we feel like nobody's even around us. Even God's not even around us. But you know what David's talking about right there? He's talking about men. Other men. And the truth is, you and I may get in a tight spot. We may get in a place where we're depressed, where we're in despair, where the darkness has enclosed us completely, it seems like. And we may look at our brothers and sisters in Christ, and while we're supposed to love each other, while we're supposed to help each other, while we're supposed to pray for each other and bear one another's burdens, the truth of the matter is, sometimes I have no idea what you're going through, and you have no idea what I'm going through. And so we may look at our brothers and sisters and say, you know what, I'd really love to tell them, but they're not going to have pity on me. They can't comfort me. Job chapter 16. Job chapter 16. The man whom God gave Satan permission to mess his life up. And Job had four friends that came to him and sat down with him and tried to be a comfort to him. But in Job 16, then answered Job verse 1 and said... I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are ye all. Those guys came to Job and they sat down. Listen, I believe they had the most sincere heart. I believe they had the best intentions for Job at hand. And they sat there and they pointed their finger at Job. And they said, Job, you have sinned. You have done wrong. God is against you. And Job in his heart said, no, I haven't. My integrity with God is in place. I'm not going to curse God. I love God. I don't know why this has happened, but I'm not going to curse God. And those guys just chapter after chapter after chapter, they just hammered on Job. You've done wrong. God's against you, Job. You've done wrong. And Job looked at him and said, you guys are miserable comforters. You know what we need to do when our brothers and sisters are struggling? Listen, we don't need to look at them and say God's against you. Although that might be the case. We ought to look at them and say, you know what? <laughs> the Lord is good. He's a strong, present help in time of need. Stronghold in time of trouble. He knoweth them that are His. Hey, won't you just go to God? Won't you just run to Him? You know, as a pastor, a lot of times I get called upon to give advice and give counsel. And, boy, you know, you try to do that, you try to help somebody. But I've learned this in just a short 18 months that I've been pastoring. The best thing I can ever do is turn somebody right back to that Word of God. Say, right here's where your help is. It's not anything I say, it's not anything that I do, it's right here. If you'll run to God, He'll help you. But if you're going to shut God out, You'll come to the, the place where you say, there's no comfort, there's no pity, nobody can help me. John 14, let's look at the comfort of the, comfort of the Spirit this morning. John chapter 14. We'll look at the comfort of the Spirit, and then we'll look at the comfort of the Scriptures. And then with what time we have left, we'll look at the hindrances to comfort. John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verse 15. <clears throat> John chapter 14, verse 15. The Bible says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even, the Bible says, the Spirit of truth. Well, aren't you glad the day you got born again, the moment, the, the instant that you were born again, the Holy Spirit of God took up residence in your life? Aren't you happy about that? I hope so. Because that's what the Bible says is the comforter. <laughs> he is the comforter, the Holy Spirit of God. And it says he's the spirit of truth, as was taught in Sunday school this morning. The truth shall make you free. Whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. Why? <laughs> For he dwelleth with you. And shall be in you. Verse 18. I will not leave you. What? Comfortless. Boy what a promise from Jesus. From the Lord himself. He's, he's getting ready to ascend. Back, actually getting ready to go to the cross and die. Then he's going to ascend back to heaven. And he says look I'm going to go away from you. But I'm going to send the comforter. 
that he would guide you and help you and comfort you. And he said, listen, here's the promise. Just as I said, I'll never, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I will not leave you comfortless. He said, if you're one of my children, you've always got hope. <laughs> well, that ought to help our hearts this morning. Verse 25. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said to you. Skip down to chapter 16, verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you, chapter 16, verse 1, that you should not be offended. Now watch what's getting ready to happen. Here's what Jesus said is going to happen to those that follow him. Okay? It's be you and I too. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. That's Saul before he became Paul. And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things have I told you that when the time shall come, you may remember that I, that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning because I was with you. But now I go my way to him that sent me. And none of you asketh me whither goest thou. But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, is it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Now, think back through what we just read. Jesus just told his disciples, he says, guys, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to be afflicted. You're going to be oppressed. Listen, somebody may even kill you thinking they're doing God a service. He said, you're going to go through all of that. And I'm going to leave you. And you're going to have sorrow of heart. But what was Jesus' answer for all of that? I'm going to send you the Comforter. The Holy Ghost of God. I'm not going to leave you comfortless. Well, we serve a great God. We serve a great Savior. So we've seen the comfort of the Spirit. This morning, now let's look at the comfort of the Scripture. Romans chapter 15. And uh, Psalm 119. Go ahead and grab those. Romans 15 and Psalm 119. Romans 15 and Psalm 119. The comfort of the Scriptures. We have the comfort of the Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the believer. And we also have the comfort of the Scriptures this morning available to us. Well, aren't you glad you got a copy of God's Word? I don't know what we'd do without it. Comfort of the Spirit and comfort of the Scriptures. We'll look at the comfort of the Scriptures now. Romans 15. <coughs> Excuse me. Romans 15, let's start reading verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have what? (laughs) Hey, is your hope in the Word of God today? Whatever problem you've got, the Word of God has an answer. Whatever situation you're dealing with, the Word of God has the answer. You say, well, it doesn't spell it out specifically. Well, in James chapter 1, you can ask God for some wisdom. And he said he'd give to all men liberally that asketh of him. He'll upbraid them not, but you've got to ask in faith. So through, there's patience and there's comfort of the Scriptures that, that yield hope to us. Now, Psalm 119. Verse 50. Well, verse 49. Remember the word unto thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope. This is my comfort and my affliction for what? Thy word. Hath quickened me. Look at uh, at verse 76 of 119. Verse 76. The Bible says, Let I pray thee thy merciful kindness be for my comfort according to thy word unto thy servant. And then if you will, look at uh, verse 82. Verse 82, same chapter. 
Well, verse 81, my soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. Mine eyes fail for thy word, saying, when will thou comfort me? All three things, or all three times that comfort's mentioned in that chapter, is connected to the word of God. Every single time. And many of the Psalms we understand, listen, many of the Psalms we understand were written by, by who? By David, right? And Solomon in Ecclesiastes 4 writes, there's no comforter. There's no comforter. There's nobody to help. There's no hope. What did Solomon ignore? He ignored the writings of David. The very words of God. He had them. They had been written mere years before he took the throne. And as Solomon ends his reign in his 40 years, those writings maybe are 40, maybe 50 years old at the most. And yet he never once consults them. And had he gone back and, and read what his father David had written, there's no way he could have made the statement, there's no comforter. For David talked often of the comfort of God. And the, and the, um, oh boy, what's the word? It just went out of my mind. David talks of the comfort of God and the refuge that God is for him. So many times. And yet Solomon ignored just that very thing. There's comfort in the, in the scriptures. We understand that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the, the great rapture passage ends with comfort. <laughs> comfort yourselves with these words. Is that what it says? Comfort one another, these words. There's comfort in the scriptures. Luke 16, verse 25, we won't turn to look at it, but talking about Lazarus and the rich man. Right, and as the rich man is in torments and he's, he's begging for Abraham to send Lazarus to drop one drop of water on his tongue. Abraham tells him, he says, says, rich man, in your life you live sumptuously and Lazarus suffered greatly, but now Lazarus is comforted. And yet there's comfort and there's hope in the fact you and I understand that when we're absent from the body, we're to be present with the Lord, those of us that are born again. That is a wonderful comfort. That's a great comfort. Acts 23. And 2 Timothy 4. Acts 23 and 2 Timothy 4. Acts 23. Here Paul standing trial before Felix. Acts 23 and verse 11. So he's gone through and he's given his, his uh, actually he's before Ananias. And uh, there at the first of, of chapter 23 is where he, <laughs> he says something he shouldn't have said to the high priest. He gets himself in trouble by shooting his mouth off. And, and he, has to, he has to back up and he has to pit the Sadducees and the Pharisees against themselves to get out of that tight spot in that situation. You get down to verse 11. Well, verse 10 says, When there arose a great dissension of the chief captains, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force among them and bring him into the castle. And the night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. <laughs> He's in the middle of the biggest trial of his life. And the Lord stands beside him and says, Paul, be of good cheer. By the way, Paul had missed God's will. He had gone against the Holy Spirit. That's why he was in this situation. Boy, isn't that a gracious God? If we get out of his will and get off the track we ought to be on, that the Lord would still stand beside us and say, be of good cheer. Just come right back over here. We'll get on, on the road again. What a Savior. He says, be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou also bear witness also at Rome. First, or 2 Timothy chapter 4. And verse, uh, verse uh, 1, Charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Verse 2, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And this is Paul's charge to Timothy. Look what it says, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their lusts, their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the what? The truth. I'd say we're in those days, folks. <laughs> People don't want to hear the truth. They want to hear what makes them feel good and feel fuzzy inside. Listen, this is a pretty fuzzy message for me this morning. <laughs> the comfort of God. 
That's a great thing. But you know, people don't even want to hear that. No, I'd, just, I'd rather go get a six-pack and just sit on the porch. No, I'd, I'd rather take the prescription drug bottle and just make it all go away. No, I'd rather just get on Facebook and talk about the problem and never really get to a resolution. It says they, won't want, they don't want endure sound doctrine <clears throat> and they don't want to hear the truth. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall, tur- and shall be turned, verse 4, into fables. But watch thou, verse 5, in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Then skip down uh, there to verse 9. It says, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Now watch all the trouble. Watch, watch. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Yeah, I didn't really pay a whole lot of attention to this before I became the pastor here. But, you know, when, when, when somebody leaves a place of ministry, I can see how that hurts. I can see how Paul would be quite depressed about Demas, one of, one of his faithful guys, leaving him. And for the reasons that he left. That hurts. Keep reading, it says, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dow. Titus. We've got an epistle by that guy. Titus left Paul. Went to Dalmatia. Keep reading. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark. Boy, we, we know about John Mark, don't we? Left Paul and Barnabas. <laughs> Take Mark, it says, and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. That's the scripture. I keep reading. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. Well, it hurts when somebody does you personally some evil, doesn't it? It hurts when somebody says things against you that are hurtful directly to you, to your face. It hurts when somebody goes behind your back and tries to manipulate things. That hurts. It hurts when someone's trust is betrayed. It hurts. And Paul said, look, all these guys, all these things have happened. Keep reading. The Lord reward him according to his works, and he will. Verse 15, of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. Verse 16, at my first answer, no man stood with me. Acts 23. But all men forsook me. Why did those guys leave Paul? Because Paul was being persecuted heavily. Why did those guys leave Paul? Because Paul's in jail. (laughs) Why did those guys leave Paul? Because he's not ministering with them anymore. He's been taken from them. And boy, there's a great message there. We're not going to preach it this morning about who are you following? Are you following a man or are you following God? But all those men left Paul and he said, No man stood with me. All men forsook me. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. What a heart. Verse 17, Notwithstanding Who stood with him? The Lord stood with me. That by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. What a great statement, Paul. Everybody's left him. All of his guys that are helping him have left him. And he's out of the will of God. He's in a place he shouldn't be, and he's in jail, and he's being persecuted. And he said, you know what? Everybody else left me alone, but the Lord stood with me. Listen, if you're a child of God this morning, did Jesus not promise you he will never leave you nor forsake you? Did he promise you that? If you're born again this morning, or you know someone in your family or one of your friends that's born again, and they are out in the world, they are out out of the will of God, has Jesus forsaken them? Not for a minute. And wherever they are to the point of the prodigal son, where they finally come to themselves, guess who's going to be standing right beside them? The Lord stood with me. And when they come to themselves and they finally turn their heart back to God, or you finally turn your heart back to God, the Lord's going to be standing right there and he's going to say, okay, come on. Let's go right back over here. Right here's where we got off. Right here's where we took the detour. Right here's where we're going to get back on the track. Follow me. What a wonderful Savior. And he's a comforter. And he's a help. Second Corinthians one. There's comfort of the scriptures. Boy, that story about Paul helps me. 
if we were all honest with one another this morning, if every one of us was honest, and we're, and we're not looking for pity, we're not looking for a pity party, but if every one of us was honest, we would say that at some point in our Christian life and our stand for Jesus Christ, we have felt like we have been standing alone. Some of you, your family won't even talk to you because of your stand on the Bible, because of what you believe. Some of you, your friends have totally forsaken you. Some of you have lost family, you've lost friends, you've lost relatives. Well, that stuff hurts. But the promise of God is the Lord standing with you. 2 Corinthians 1. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God... And Timothy, our brother under the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in Acacia, grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all what? Verse 4, who comforteth us in all our tribulation. Now that's a great thing, isn't it? That God would comfort you and I in our tribulation. That's a wonderful thing. But keep reading. Why is he doing that? (laughs) It's not just for us. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Are you getting the picture that this Christian life is not just about me and you? It's not about me personally. It's about us and how we affect other people. And listen, God may put you through a trial. Listen to me. He may put you through a trial that he could show you comfort because if you don't go through that trial, guess what you can't experience? You can't experience the comfort of God. He may put you and I through a trial. He may put us through a tough time that he can show his comfort to us, could be ministered to us by the Holy Spirit of God, be ministered to us by the Scriptures, the Holy Word of God. And when you and I come out on the other side victorious because of his help, the next time somebody goes through that, you and I can go right to them and say, Hey, brother, I know, sister, I know exactly what you're going through. Let me show you how God did it for me. Boy, don't you think that helps somebody's heart? It's not just about us, folks. And the great comfort of God that's available through the Holy Spirit and through the Scriptures, we ought to learn of it. We ought to be familiar with it so that we can help other people. So we can comfort other people. We've seen the comfort of the Spirit and we've seen the comfort of the Scriptures. And now just a few minutes that are left this morning, I want to talk about the hindrances to comfort. The hindrances to comfort. Let's go to Job chapter 1 and Genesis 27. Job 1 and Genesis 27. Job 1 and Genesis 27. Hindrances to comfort. It's available... It's available through the Holy Spirit of God. It's available through the Scriptures. But you've got to want it. And you've got to ask God for it. And you've got to search it out. Job 1. We've talked a little bit about all that happened to Job. I love how verse 1 ends, or chapter 1 ends, I'm sorry. Chapter 1, verse 22, In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. You know what will hinder you and I in getting comfort from God every single time? It's for us to do the opposite of what Job did, and for us to look at God and point a finger at Him and say, Why did you let this happen to me? That's not a good first step. Hey, I've, I've, watched, I've watched folks in this church go through trials. I've watched my mom and dad go through a trial. You know what's a real blessing to me? You know what's really helped me in my life? Is to see you all who have gone through great trials, health trials, losses of loved ones, losses of family members. To see you all who have gone through that not stand there and point your finger at God and say, God, why did you let this happen to me? No, it was just the opposite. I believe every, every one of you turned and you ran to God. You said, oh God, would you help me? 
Lord, we don't understand it. Lord, we don't know why this happened, but we love you and we trust you and you're only wise and for you to you be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. And Lord, we just want you to comfort us and help us through this. Lord, your will be done. <laughs> Boy, that'll help. You know what the worst thing to do is sit there and point your finger at God thinking that you're something special, that this happened to you because of something God has against you. Boy, that's, that's the farthest thing. That's exactly what Satan wants you to believe. That's the farthest thing from the truth. The only place we could run. Where could I turn, Peter said. Lord, where could we go? You have the words of life. Where else can we go? Anything else outside of God in that situation is going to be a failure and it's going to be empty. Genesis 27. Genesis 27. A hindrance to comfort is to charge God foolishly, number one. Second hindrance to comfort is right here, Genesis 27, verse 41. This is after Jacob has deceived his father and, and gained Esau's blessing. Genesis 27, verse 41, the Bible says this, And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, now watch, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. And the words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. And she went and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau, as touching thee, doth what? Comfort himself, purposing to kill you. The first hindrance to comfort is pointing our finger at God and charging him foolishly. The second hindrance to comfort is trying to get revenge. <laughs> Ms. Lori and I taught those, those 6th and 7th graders at Swords Creek Elementary School Friday. And I went, I went through something like this about getting revenge on people. Well, I couldn't believe that. What are, you, what are you teaching me, Tater Man? What do you mean I don't deck him? <laughs> That's what the, they asked that, didn't they? I said, what are you going to do if somebody tries to punch you? I'm going to knock him out, man. One of the greatest, hum, one of the greatest hindrances to comfort in our lives will be our, our, our striving for vengeance. Man, somebody does you wrong, just get over it. You can't, you can't experience comfort if you're trying to get vengeance. And listen, I'm not really sure getting vengeance is the right kind of comfort. I'm not really sure that's the lasting comfort. That's certainly not the comfort the Holy Spirit will give you. Y'all familiar with the Hatfields and McCoys, aren't you? I'll show you how vengeance turns out. Just keeps going. Esau comforted himself with revenge. In Romans chapter 12, we won't take time to read all that, but Romans chapter 12 reminds us that if someone does us wrong, just let it go. Just, just let it go. Genesis 37, number 3. Third hindrance to comfort, Genesis 37. Genesis 37. I've sat across the table with people that have brought accusations against me to my face that were not true. I've sat across the table from people that have brought accusations against this church that were not true. I've sat across the table from people that have said hurtful words about my family and about this church. I said, Pastor, what would you do? I let it go. If it was hard, you better believe it. We want to justify ourselves, don't we? But that's not going to get anywhere. Genesis 37, verse 29. The Bible says in Reuben, return. Now, this is when they're trying to sell off Joseph. Reuben returned unto the pit and Behold, Joseph was not in the pit, and he rent his clothes and returned unto his brethren, <clears throat> and said, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? And they took Joseph's coat and killed a kid of the, of the goats and dipped the coat in blood. And they sent the coat of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, This have we found. Know now whether it be thy son's coat or no. And he knew it and said, It is my son's coat. An evil beast hath devoured him. Joseph is without doubt rent in pieces. And Jacob rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his loins and mourned for his son many days. 
And all of his sons and all of his daughters rose up to comfort him. <laughs> Here's the third hindrance. But he refused to be comforted. The first hindrance is pointing a finger at God and charging him foolishly. The second hindrance is, is getting after vengeance. And the third hindrance is just saying, I'm not going to be comforted. Well, we're stubborn sometimes, aren't we? What, what a slap in the face of someone that tries to help you and tries to comfort you and tries to be a help to you. And you sit there and say, no, I don't want that. And yet God all day long is reaching out his hands, trying to help and comfort people. And they say, no, God, I don't want it. And he says, okay, well, wallow in your pity then. He says, he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I will go down into the grave unto my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. If it hadn't been for the grace of God, that would, is exactly what would have happened to him. But God allowed him to see his son. Number four, Psalm 94. Well, the comfort of God's a great thing. It's a beautiful thing. It's a wonderful thing. It'll help you and I through some of the darkest, deepest pits we could ever go through. The darkest, deepest valleys we could ever go through. Psalm 94. Here's the fourth hindrance. Psalm 94, <clears throat> verse 19. In the multitude of my thoughts... Within me, thy comforts delight my soul. You remember when the Bible said that David encouraged himself in the Lord? When he was all by himself. When things were dark. When, when Saul was trying to kill him. Nobody was with him. You know what I believe David helped David get through that more than anything? He had hid the word of God in his heart. And his thoughts went back to those precious promises of God. And how God loved him. And how God cares for him. He says, in the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. Ecclesiastes 4. Verse 1. The first three words of that verse. The Bible says, so I returned. Anybody ever been daydreaming before? Who's daydreaming right now? <laughs> you know what all, all that that Solomon wrote in chapter 3 all of that as he's as he's sitting there with his heart turned away from God and he's daydreaming and he's coming up with all these things listen if you get the doctrine for your life while you're daydreaming you're off base if I get the doctrine for my life daydreaming I'm out of the will of God <laughs> One of my favorite places to sit and, and meditate about, about life and, and think through things and, and think about the Word of God, I love sitting on the side of a, of a river bank. Nobody's laughing. That's good. What the, I fear somebody accused me of fishing instead of thinking. I do. I love it. But there, there's nothing more peaceful to me than just hearing that background noise of the water running and just sitting there. But you know, if you and I aren't careful, we'll get over here in daydream land and we'll get off base, according to the Bible. And Solomon here, he says, so I returned. Where had you been, Solomon? About five million miles away in my mind. But I came back. Folks, our thought life is so important. What we think about, what we allow to go through our minds during the day, it's so important. Unless we be deceived in our minds, the Lord sees every bit of it. That's scary. There's things that go through my head, I'll not go through my head, I'll be honest with you. There's things that go through your head, shouldn't go through your head. You'll be honest with me. The Lord sees it all. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, encourages us to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Look, if you and I are thinking through things and we get a crazy idea and it goes against God's word, you better not follow that thought. Philippians 4. We'll end right here. Philippians 4. 
And if you're like me, you've been in a tight spot, you've been in a situation where oppression was coming or oppression was perceived to be coming. You can ask my wife. Um, there's been some situations with the schools this year. I'll be honest with you. With schools this year, uh, somebody said something. A teacher said something or a student said something. And I would come home and I will fret over that for a full day. You can ask her. You know why I do that? Because I'm not, I'm not gaining control of my imaginations. And immediately I start imagining the worst case scenario. How am I going to deal with this? How am I going to, if it all falls apart, how am I going to deal with it? That, that's just how I operate. Maybe you operate that way. Maybe you don't. If you don't, you're blessed. <laughs> but I operate that. What are those? Those are imaginations. Some of them are right. Some of them are wrong. But they're imaginations. Philippians 4, I love verse 6 and 7. I need to, I need to memorize verse 8. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, that's tied to comfort, and the peace of God which passes all understandings shall keep your hearts and minds through, the Bible says, Christ Jesus. Verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, what's it say, everybody? Think on these things. Say, so, Pastor, I'm going through a trial right now. I understand you've got to think about it a little bit. But listen, don't let that trial consume your mind. You know what will help us so many times to be a, be a contrast to that mess? It's just to sit back and say, you know what, Lord, you've been so good to me today. <laughs> Lord, I'm still breathing. You've blessed me with every creature comfort I can think of. I appreciate that, Lord. And you know, if we would, if we would think about how good God's been to us, sometimes those perceived trials and sometimes those perceived mountains and valleys that we have to go through, sometimes they get a little bit smaller. They get a little bit brighter when we start thinking about other things or we try to help somebody else, perhaps. You know, Elijah, he had defeated the 450 prophets of Baal, killed them all and threw them in the brook Kishon out there. You know what happens in the next chapter? Jezebel sends him a note and says, I'm going to kill you. And he goes into the deepest depression of his life. And you say, how could that happen? How could a man that comes off a great victory like that for God, how could he let the words of a wicked queen trouble him? I don't know. How do you and I live a victorious life through Jesus Christ and let the words of somebody trouble us? It's the same situation. Abraham Lincoln said this. He said, most people are as happy as they make up their minds to be. Folks, the Lord's a God of all comfort. There's comfort in the scriptures. There's comfort through the Holy Spirit. May we lean on that and not try to find the answer to our comfort in the world, not try to find our answer to comfort in other men and other women, but may we go directly to God and let Him be our comfort. Let's pray this morning. Father, we do love you. And thank you again for the time you've given us to be in, in your house this morning. With